Okay, as I was saying, I was getting into full-on rant mode here. Uh, I've decided that, you know, um, to kind of go along with Joe Klein's talk, that it might always be a good idea to have a talk prepared, no matter where you go, just in case. You never know. And then, you know, here, here's a case in point. Works out here. All right. Um, hang on a second. I've got to fix this real quick. In fact, I could lean down here and talk like this while I'm getting my coffee ready to go, and hopefully the mic won't roll too much. Mm, need coffee. Very little sleep. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. Okay. Uh, the sleep thing that I speak of is something that you require every now and then or you go bug shit crazy. Really, I know. It's true. Okay. How do y'all like Freak Nick so far? Having fun? Woo! Freak Nick, Freak Nick. Okay. I'm enjoying the hell out of it. I got this nifty backpack here. And as you can see, I have a banana in my pocket. And I'm really happy to see y'all. And in my other pocket here, I got hacker inside condoms. So we're all set to go. And uh, I'm feeling lucky. So hope you have a good weekend here. Hope you all do too. I guess I'm a speaker now, so maybe they'll give me my money back on the, the backpack and you know, my badge to get in here. That would be kind of cool. Dole might owe me 50 bucks now. And oh, this part, especially for Maverick, DJ Ron says hi. Got to rag Maverick a little bit since he's not here. I like Maverick. Maverick is cool. Um, I thought of something real scary on the way up here before I get to my talk because I'm still trying to figure out exactly what I'm going to talk about. I think I've got most of it, but think about this. Maverick is truly the heart and soul of Freaknik and the Nashville 2600 scene. He is. He's the only person who's been here from the beginning for both of these. He's been here for Freaknik 1 through 8. He was at the very first Nashville 2600 meeting. Still goes to them every now and then, I understand. Maverick's the man. Maverick represents. Maverick's the heart and the soul, and that scares the shit out of me. All right, talk for today. As some of you may have noticed over the last couple of years, uh, not trying to get too terribly political here. Okay, I am trying to get political here. Our current administration seems to have this problem with separation of church and state. And, um, well, that can be bad in a lot of ways, but if you're interested in exploring and perverting complicated systems like... Um, Legal system, political system. There's some fun things you can do with that. And how many of you are familiar with low-power community FM radio stations, LPFM? Okay, that's good. Good people here. Um, you're aware that a lot of the planned low-power FM radio stations uh, were never able to materialize. The laws were changed at the last second. Thank you, National Association of Broadcasters, you fuckheads. Uh, basically, they lied to Congress uh, about band channel separation, and instead of thousands of community low-power FM radio stations popping up all over the U.S., we've only got a few hundred that are going to be available, at least right now. Maybe things will change again at some point in the future. And a uh, completely different rant for those of us who are pissed off about low-power community FM radio stations. We were told, oh, hey, you know, Internet streaming, you can always fall back on that. Oops, they went after that next. But back to LPFM. So you've only got a few hundred LPFM stations available. And you've got to go through this long, complicated applications process with the FCC, which currently doesn't seem to see the broadcast spectrum as a limited natural resource that belongs to everybody and that they're supposed to regulate and protect for the mutual benefit of all Americans, but instead something to sell off to corporate America. But that's another rant for another time. Anyway, um, you've got to go through this long process to to apply for these few limited LPFM spots here. And something interesting that's been noticed is these low-power community FM radio stations are non-commercial, supposed to be non-commercial, and um, not just community organizations and groups can apply for them, but churches can apply for them too. And in fact, a lot of churches have applied for these. I think, the, if I remember correctly, the original designations were supposed to be 10-watt uh, licenses up to 100-watt licenses and up to 1,000-watt. They blew the thousand watt licenses away when the, um, the uh, three channel separation rule was put into place or two channel whichever it was. Originally it was supposed to be single channel separation but uh, again National Association of Broadcasters lied, lied, they lied and uh, got that blown out of the water so they blew it away. Most places have been going for the uh, 100 watt stations. I'm not sure what the status is on the 10 watt stations. Uh, at that point, you just might as well, well, theoretically, hypothetically, at that point, if you're only going to be dealing with 10 watts or less, you know, why even bother? Just you know, go pirate, fuck it. Um, unless you have a pressing need to want to be legit and then go for the 100-watt stations. Churches seem to be getting preference on these 100-watt stations. Interesting statistic, interesting maybe statistical anomaly, maybe a fluke, maybe it's not. So 
you and a bunch of friends who want access to the airwaves, damn it, and you haven't been able to social engineer your way into a college radio station, um, like yours truly did, and uh, you know do your show that way. You, you know even that maybe is not enough. You want your own radio station, so what do you do? You you want to expedite this process, and you want someone else to pick up the tab for it. Well, freedom of religion, baby. Freedom of religion here in the U.S. of A. It's a good thing. It's a cool thing. I've looked into this. I'm ordained in 27 different mail order ministries, and I confirmed that, by the way, a couple of months ago. I found my ordinations. They were in a box, um, packed up. I've moved a lot the last couple of years, but I confirmed it. I wasn't sure if it was 25 or 26 or 27, and somewhere around there, it's 27 right now. I may have to get a few more. But um, I'm thinking, you know, why get ordained in someone else's church? We got freedom of religion here, so what do I got to do to start my own church? And it's not a difficult process. It really isn't. Um, pretty much... The rule, you know, the details vary from state to state, but the um, process is pretty similar all over the place. And the main place you start is your county clerk's office. And just go down and see, hey, I want to start my own church. You know, maybe if you want to take you somewhat seriously, you should dress nice and, or have someone with, you know, short hair go in, dress nice, and call yourself reverend, father, minister, whatever. Uh, by the way, on your application process here, I'm going to jump ahead for, uh, real quick. Uh, you got, you got to, people get really funny if they think you're making fun of religion. Um, some people get really pissed off about this for some reason. I don't know, no sense of humor. But um, you kind of want to maintain a low profile until all your paperwork's in place. So, you know, you may be tempted to be, you know, Reverend Smegma. Woohoo! But on your application process, put down Father Richard Cheese. You know, just, you know, until... Until you get through that whole process, and, and then you're good to go. But um, basically, what they're looking for for your application here, you're, you're doing a nonprofit, and you're going to need to have three officer positions um, pretty much filled for your church. And you've got to have um, your pastor, your minister, your rabbi, your flying flying nun, Lord High Executioner of the Word of God, whatever the religious title is. Again, don't get too extravagant on the religious titles until. The paperwork has been processed and you got the license. But the most important one is going to be your spiritual leader, whatever this person's official title will be. Um, the mo two other more normal positions you need are a secretary and a treasurer. Um, the structure is set up very much like a, uh, your typical corporation, your typical nonprofit. You, um, some places will require four officers. You've got to have, like, the equivalent of a president and a vice president. So you have a minister, an assistant minister, or a backup minister, or a failover minister, or something like that. But the treasurer and the secretary are pretty much standard. Um, and you get incorporated as a nonprofit. Usually, some places will use the same forms as a nonprofit. Others will have special church type forms that you're supposed to do. Um, again, separation of church and state makes it kind of weird. Um, just depends. You got you actually look at the forms and fill them out. Um, fill them out. Pay your ten, fifteen, twenty dollars, whatever it is, varies from state to state, and. Um, you set up. The only thing you need a after that is uh, you got to have worshipers, and you got to have a place to worship. Those last two aren't as difficult to come up with as you might think, because worshipers can be any group of two or more people who go, "Yes, you are our spiritual leader." And a uh, place to worship, you don't even have to have your own building. You can you can rent some place. You know, you can um, you can use uh, uh, some places. We'll do, like, high school classrooms on a weekend, on a Sunday or something like that, when class isn't in session. True story. I used to live down in uh, Barnesville, Georgia, when I was a little kid, and they didn't have an Episcopal church in Barnesville, Georgia, so the Episcopal church met in uh, Barnesville Academy in one of the high school rooms for a couple of years. And, and uh, location isn't really that important initially. You're going to have to worry about it later because once you're established as a church, you've got your paperwork straight, you're a nonprofit. You do have to keep records on the nonprofit, by the way, because the IRS has no fucking sense of humor whatsoever. They don't. They just keep all that stuff straight. Don't be tempted to dip into the till because you can get in trouble that way. I mean, if you're Jimmy Swaggart or someone like that, you can afford the lawyers to you know, dip into the till every now and then and afford your extravagant lifestyle. Or if not, I'm insinuating that any TV evangelist would ever, of course, you know, deceive their followers and steal from them. No, no, not at all. No, no, they're sending Bibles to El Salvador constantly, something like that. But, um, you know, you, you don't want to be like a Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and get hauled off for some piddly amount of cash that isn't worth it, you know? Maybe it's a few million dollars, yeah, you could, you could do with uh, some embarrassing media exposure or stuff like that, but 
Yeah, small amounts are what you're going to be doing now. No, no, keep it honest, keep it clean. You're spiritual advisors. You're supposed to keep everything on the up and up, theoretically. So once you're set up with your paperwork, you got your followers, you got your church, you got to meet weekly, pretty much. Um, can vary a little bit on that too, depending on your particular religious beliefs. By the way, when you do to your church and you get your group of people together and you're going in to do all the applications and paperwork, in theory, anyone can attend the church as you want, so you may want to have your religious beliefs, you know, kind of set up in advance. You may want to work this out beforehand and not have to do this spur of the moment in case someone walks in and actually wants to worship with you. So, you know, just and keep, and keep that in mind. Um, but once you're set up as an as official legal church in the government's eyes, in the IRS's eyes, then you can go ahead and you can apply for your community low power FM radio station license. And that's where it gets interesting. Um, as I said, it, it seems the last couple of years that religious organizations have been getting some precedence on that, and especially those that tend to be of a conservative Christian faith. So maybe you want to kind of go in that direction. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you how to worship, I'm just saying maybe, maybe. At that point, if you want to do this for more than just a lark and you actually do plan on broadcasting and setting up, um, you are going to have to pull in some people from the local community um, around you. There's a low power station that's set up out in, uh, what the hell is the name of that place? Pasco, Pasco, I-40 West, kind of uh, Franklin and, and Fairview type area. They've got license. It used to be radio free nashville.org, but I think the, the site's defunct. I'm not sure if they're even still active anymore. They spoke at a couple uh, freak nicks years previously, but um, they've actually got their 100-watt license as a community FM radio station. I don't know if anything's ever going to come of that, but um, if you actually get to the point where you want to go on the air and do this, radio itself isn't that expensive um, compared to other forms of broadcast media, and up to a 100-watt transmitter, get the local hams involved, again, those with a sense of humor, and you shouldn't have to put out more than ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, and this isn't a type of deal where you've got to have it set up immediately on the ball. It's got to take you um, months to actually get the facility set up property. You will have to have a little bit of land. You'll have to have a relatively secure place for the transmitter. The FCC will have to certify it, but if you are serious, you will make it happen. It's not that, not that difficult a thing to do, and... Um, Think about the cost of putting Freaknik on and the plan or planning and organization that goes into that. For probably an amount of planning and organization required to put together Freaknik, you could put together a low-power community FM radio station for a church of whatever. Uh, we you call it uh, Church of Bob, for example. And Praise Bob, indeed. Hey, yeah, it sounds like we've got the beginnings of religion here. By the way, if you want to be clever and put yourself down as a branch of the Church of the Subgenius, don't. I mean, Church of the Subgenius is way cool. Praise Bob from who all flows. But the Church of the Subgenius is one of the few officially recognized churches in the United States of America that has been denied tax-exempt status. In fact, I think at this point they're the only one that's been denied tax-exempt status because someone in the IRS did not have a sense of humor when they said, well, yeah, we'd like to follow as a nonprofit, but we're all about capitalism. Fuck yeah, we want the money. And, and uh, for some reason, their tax free status was denied. Who knows? I don't know. <sighs> Caffeine yet. That's good. So, um, at that point, okay, you've got your license, you've got your facility built, and, uh, well, you won. But now maybe comes the hardest part of all, because. You got a radio station, and you got to use it, and that, in my experience, has been where our, most of the hard work and dedication comes in. Um, when I worked over at WRBU, it was not uncommon at the beginning of the uh, the fall semester you'd have 200 people show up on DJ positions, uh, and there, even for college radio, where you've got different DJ um, every two, three hours, all seven days of the week. Um, there, there aren't that many slots to go around for everybody. So people get denied slots. You've got to train for a, a semester with another DJ, blah, blah, blah. And you can tell pretty quickly who's serious about it and who isn't because after about the first, second month, the folks who've got the relatively crappy time slots are the ones who are just lazy fucktards stop showing up. And you got uh, a lot of dead air, and that's when the people who are really dedicated will uh, step up and start taking those slots. And they'll work the 
the 2 a.m. Uh, uh, Tuesday 3 to 6 a.m. slot for a whole semester just so they can get a better one the next semester and the fun part comes when you've got your core group of people there you've got this nonprofit you've got a listening audience may not be the best you know, 100 watts but still um, you can do a lot of interesting stuff with that. Uh, again, freedom of religion, you can stay away from George Carlin's Seven Dirty Words. You can, uh, you can use this as a wonderful exercise in satire, social commentary, and play some pretty good music, um, too. The, um, by the time the, the license has is, is been granted and the facilities are built, I mean, it's pretty much in the clear. It's kind of hard to fuck up at that point unless you're actually swearing as much as I am on the air. Um, the only thing you really got to keep in mind is that um, the community stations are under the same seven-year license renewal review uh, status as uh, commercial stations are. And much as we might like for a clear channel to have all of their license yanked at the end of seven years, that ain't going to happen. Um, they got too much money, too much influence, too many buddies in high places, too many lobbyists. And... Um, if you really, really, really piss off constantly everybody in your listening area, the FCC can simply say um, at the end of seven years, and possibly even sooner if there are enough complaints, and they are legitimate complaints, that uh, you are not meeting community standards, you are not serving the local listening area, and they can pull the license. So, yeah, fun and subterfuge when you're first getting set up if you actually make it on the air. Um, be prepared to do some work, but um, it's worth it, in my opinion. So, um, questions? I, I need to stop talking for a couple minutes because my throat's starting to get a little bit sore, and I also want to finish my coffee before it gets cold. You gotta wave your hand, and that gentleman in the back did first, so go for it. The question is, how many hours of what? Well, right now, um, I'm not on the air. Um, I've got a couple different places down Atlanta. I don't live in Nashville anymore, but when I was up here, um, I put in, at a minimum, about three hours a week for my show. I prefer to get the uh, midnight to 6 a.m. slots simply because those are safe harbor hours. Um, let me explain that if you're not familiar with the term. Um, safe harbor hours means pretty much all that you are required to do is give a station ID at the top of every hour. WRVU Nashville. That's it. The rest of the time, the rest of the time I'm DJing, I can be like playing static, um, and mixing in three different Marisbo albums and banging on a cowbell nonstop. And I've done that. Um, the uh, outside safe harbor hours, which is going to be defined when um, children might be listening, which is also a code phrase for the easily offended. You also have to take into mind community standards, uh, community decency standards. And it's one of those kind of vague areas. It's not really too defined by law, and it's been used as a double-edged sword to, in some, uh, I guess, more uptight communities to, to really clobber some college radio stations. I mean, oh, my God, they played a, a song where the lyrics are about two women kissing, find the college radio station you know, five times what their annual budget is. And... Uh, yeah, at the same time in that, that area, the, one of the local commercial stations may be carrying Howard Stern relays. You know, it's just one of those weird things you got to be careful about. Anyway, I did, um, I usually put in about three hours a week. That was the length of my show. But because I had the midnight to 3 a.m. slot on um, uh, Saturday night or Sunday morning, depending on your point of view, a lot of times the 3 to 6 guy wouldn't come in after me. So sometimes I would go six hours. Sometimes I'd even go eight hours until whoever came in next. Depended on, one, how much caffeine I'd had, two, um... How many other people were there with me? Um, sometimes it's a lot of fun if you've got some music and you've got everything planned out. You're doing kind of a theme thing. You're the only person in there, no distractions while you're working. Other times, uh, for me anyway, when I was working at WRVU, it was more a party. And it was like, oh, yeah, that thing's going to end in a couple minutes. Someone push that button over there or put something else on real quick. So um, at the bare minimum, plan on at least doing a weekly DJ show. Um, if there are obviously far fewer people involved in the, at the station, you've got your transmitter and you've got your license and everything, you'll, you may be doing a nightly show. You may be do, doing several hours a night. And if you can figure out a way to uh, make it pay for itself or perhaps even pay some of your bills, God bless you, literally, seriously. Um, that's way cool. Um, otherwise, 
you usually want to put in as much time when you're not DJing, planning out what you're going to do. And me, I like messing around in the studio. I like doing audio cut up and collage and, and playing around with stuff like that. So I'll, I'll fuck around in the studio for hours just kind of putting together weird stuff or station IDs or promos. Um, <laughs> I w early on in my career, um, we had, and I'll get to the gentleman over there in a minute, we still got about 10 minutes left. Um, early on in my career, we found out, I think it was the first semester I was DJing, that there were a group of local churches, very conservative churches, who were monitoring us 24 hours a day. And our license was coming up for renewal. This was 93, I believe. And um, they were convinced that, and this is quote, totally serious, we were of the devil and corrup corrupting the youth of Middle Tennessee, unquote. Well, yeah, according to some people. And uh, so they were monitoring us 24 hours a day, recording stuff. Th the interesting thing is they knew a lot of our playlists and they knew a lot of what we had um, in rotation at the stations. So they would call up DJs and try to get them to play stuff that had yeah, you know, one of the seven, uh, George Carlin, seven words, and to, to, so they could all go to the FCC, see, see, we recorded, they did this, oh my God, oh my God, think of the children, and try to get his fines or guess yanked off the air. The reason we thought about all this is um, the minister's daughter, 15, 14, 15 year old daughter at one of these churches was a real fan of the Wednesday night heavy metal show. So she wrote a letter tipping us off about this. And uh, um, this was read out the first staff meeting, and weren't quite sure what to do, and so someone said, well, she lives at the church. The church is there. Let's get some volunteers, some of the more respectable-looking people here, and let's go to church Sunday morning and see if this is real. And by God, it was, you know, railing from the pulpit. And they would have their after-church meetings and uh, after the sermon and everything, and sit down and all write mass letters to the FCC complaining and bitching about blah, 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 whatever they'd heard that week. And... Um, and so we were on our P's and Q's. We knew they were listening. And we were checking with uh, Vandy lawyers to see what we could do about this. But in the meantime, you know, we were getting assigned our shows. And, uh, well, guess who got the you know, Saturday night, Sunday morning slot, which was the last show before church. And that's when I began my love affair with... Uh, industrial, experimental noise, and especially Japanese noise bands. This is the Reverend Dr. Johnny Anonymous, this is pre-Pope upgrade. You're listening to WRVU Nashville 91 Noise, and now a, another three hours of non-stop mare's bow. <laughs> yeah, just like that. I'm channeling the spirits of industrial music. Yay, brother! Hallelujah! Hallelujah. All right. So yeah, I just I had this you know, mental image in my mind of some poor little old man or woman sitting there at you know, three o'clock in the morning, got to get up for church in a couple hours, just sitting here going, "What is this?" Yeah, and it's, yeah, that really motivated me. It was a lot of fun, and I would also kind of toss in things like uh, "Negative Land Christianity is Stupid" and. Uh, uh, George Thurwell, the only good Christian is a dead Christian, and yeah, announce the songs with great relish and much gusto and solicit death threats. Yeah. Comments, criticisms, requests, death threats. 322 three, two, two, rock, 421 rock. Rock is still 7625 in case you happen to be temporarily illiterate at the moment. Remember, rock is. Something like that. Yeah, thank you. Works better when I've got both hands free. And I would record the incoming phone calls and, and death threats and turn them into station IDs and promos for the show and stuff like that. So it was a lot of fun. That only lasted for a couple of weeks because once they realized I was doing this, they stopped calling in. And I was also taken gently aside and said, okay, what are you doing? And I was like, well, yeah, I'm funny. Okay, stop. It's funny, but just, no, don't do it anymore, okay? So um, anyway, there was a question over here. I'm sorry I was ranting so long. Yes. I'm going to make you ask this all over again. Regarding the low power community stations, what are the rules regarding sponsors and advertising? Okay, for the community low power FM stations, they're non commercial stations, so you can't really do paid advertising. And if it's a supposedly a church run station, you know, it's got to be a non profit. Now, however, you can have um, community sponsors and supporters. That's a different matter entirely. Uh, your uh, tax free deduction to Church of Bob, WBOB, blah, 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 blah. But um, yeah, they're all supposed to be non commercial, so you can't accept paid advertising. 
Pardon me. Um, next question. Anyway, come on. I have some more questions. We've still got five minutes to kill. Okay, the risk of being a fucktard not being here for the first three quarters of what you're speaking about. Um, one of the things I'm curious about, and it's almost saying, letting you know, coming from St. Louis, there's no available bandwidth because of this stupid second adjacent channel rule. Did you address that? Okay, never mind. Yes, I did. And really, the only solution at that point is. Uh, uh, you said it, not me. <laughs> Mojo Nixon's got a cool song about that. Um, hypothetically, theoretically, if I had ever been involved with a pirate radio station, <clears throat> WRAG, where radio alternative games will come at you with two watts of screaming power at the bottom of the FM barrel, that's 87.5. Get on the rag. If I was ever involved with such an entity, um, I would suggest that you, you keep your transmitter fairly low power, um, you know, two watts of raw power was uh, was pretty good. We covered, theoretically, we could have covered all of Gainesville. And uh, theoretically, if we had moved the transmitter regularly during our broadcast times and kind of vary the broadcast schedule, um, you know, very important broadcasts or things, uh, theoretically, that we wanted to get out if we did, like, word of mouth or flyers or stuff like that, it would be pretty much okay. Um, now... Theoretically, hypothetically, after, after I left Gainesville, this station, pirate radio station, popped up with suspiciously similar letters to WRAG, we're Radio Alternative Gainesville. Um, and they boosted the transmitter to 10 watts, and they stopped moving the transmitter on a nightly basis because they were smoking too much pot, and they got busted. And uh, FCC sees the transmitter. I think everyone involved at that point was fined uh, about $1,000 I don't remember what the full story was. That was after I was, that was about a year after I was gone and I was doing roadie stuff. Um, let me get a question in the back and then I'll get you next. You come up here because I'm tired of running out there. Although, caffeine's really starting to feel good now. I'm going to be bouncing like this all night. Woohoo! Okay. Is there any chance you're going to reprise um, the 91 Noise show sometime this weekend? Tried, not going to happen. Uh, that's why I didn't bring any of my music with me, which I couldn't get to anyway because it's all in boxes packed up in a storage facility at the very bottom of the storage facility. If anyone has seen how much crap I have that I have to, yeah, those who have helped me move it, you'll understand when I say, okay, storage facility room piled up to the ceiling, boxes with CDs and most of my music, bottom in the back. Uh-uh, ain't going to happen. Sorry. Uh, I will be back for... Um, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Thank you, Google. Thank you for allowing me for the first time in three years to actually spend the holidays with my family. So I'm going to try to get some airtime um, over Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I will update you all on uh, the route at sc2600.org list and WRVU streams. So next question. Back to the idea of what you were talking about with the low-powered stations, the church stations or whatever. Is there an actual... Uh, amount of time that you must broadcast each week in order to keep the station? Yes. Oh, you want me to go into more detail? Okay. Um, I don't remember. I believe it's um, between 40 and 50% of the time. Um, so like minimum of 8 or 12 hours a day. I don't remember which one it is. It's, it's on the FCC's website, though. All the requirements, all the paperwork is on there. It takes a little bit of searching to dig the stuff up. They could really use, you know, like a Google search appliance or something. But um, you can find the information. And you can also use Google to, you know, just Google the information directly, not on the FCC site. And there are a bunch of other um, LPFM support sites and communities and groups out there. They've got the details. Just make sure the stuff that they've got um, is current because... Yes, the government. They got to change the rules every so often so they can get, keep getting paid to push paper around. Uh, yeah, t one more question. You're in. You have to keep track of what you play and then pay fees to the powers that have all the music? You got to keep track of what you play. Um, the fees part, uh, it's a little bit different situation for a, a, uh, a nonprofit. There are some fees involved, you pay them to the different services that collect the royalties, but the, the rates are different and substantially lower for non-commercial. And a lot of times, again, if you're, 
if initially your image is clean you know, and clean cut and you contact these places via email or a very nicely spell checked letter, typed letter on decent looking stationery, um, you can get some of those fees waived because you're a nonprofit and you're a religious organization. They can write this off as a, uh, for their, their tax purposes. So you, know, you just got to be creative about it. And, and you know, don't be afraid to talk to people and ask questions. Just if you've got green hair and tattoos and facial piercings, make sure that your only initial interaction with these folks is either through email or professionally typed nice looking letters. Social engineering, it's all about perception. All right, uh, thank you very much for letting me rant incoherently for half an hour. Um, I have no idea who's up next, but the, this is an actual prepared talk coming up, so stick around for it, and I'm going to go see if I can get, uh, <laughs> get my badge and backpack fee refunded since now I'm a speaker. <laughs>